sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd Alhamdulillah it's a great honor to be teaching this text with you insha'Allah This is the first time I will be teaching this particular text And this text I entitled Al-Arba'oon the 40 hadith fi shama'il Sayyid al-Kawm On the shama'il or the sublime characteristics and qualities outer and inner of the most blessed of creation, the master of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And before we start, let me introduce this work. This work is a text of 40 hadith in following the tradition of the great muhaddithin, starting with Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and going through the other great muhaddithin who authored works like this. And this is what we call a Musnad work. And the Musnad work means that each hadith, I provide my Isnad, Isnad being Silsilat al Rijal al Musila il al Matan, the Sanad being the Silsila of Rijal, the chain of men or people that connects one to the text of any narration. And so by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and from the angle of speaking about the great favors that Allah has had upon us, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Duha, in Surah Al-Duha, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ And speak about and recount the great blessings that Allah has had upon you. And so I enumerate the great blessing that I'm honored to have traveled around the world and read the Shama'il of Al Imam Abu Isa, Muhammad ibn Isa, Ibn Musa, Ibn Sawra, Al Dahak, Al Sulami, Al Bughi, Al Tirmidhi, Rahimullah, with over 30 scholars worldwide, having traveled from Trinidad to Indonesia and many countries in between. And I'm not aware of anybody who has achieved this. And this is from the great blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have narrated and read this work completely min awalihi ila akhirihi from its beginning to its end the last time i read this work was in fact about 10 days ago in the town of sarang in western java with the great sheikh of indonesia sheikh maimoun zubair hafizahullah who is approximately 90 years old and so this work is a collection of 417 hadith that of Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah and it takes quite a long time to study particularly if one is not used to the Arabic script F for this reason I felt that and having looked throughout the publications and classical works I did not find anyone authored an Arba'un collection on the Shama'il of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so I felt that this was something that I could contribute to the field of Shama'il in order, particularly in the age that we live in, the age of the five to ten minute YouTube clip or the Facebook era that we are in, where more and more increasingly we find people not being able to concentrate with long works or with lengthy lectures and lessons. SubhanAllah. So having a work of such as the 40 hadith is something that can be easily studied and digested by students over a weekend course. And in fact, subhanAllah, if we look at Imam Manawi rahimullah and his intention behind his authoring of the Arba'un, uh, he mentions also that his goal was to bring together 40 of the most important hadith that would be essential for the life of a Muslim. And so here I have also intended in much the same way to gather together 40 of the most important hadith in regards to the shama'il, the sublime characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now this work is based upon the shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi Rahimullah, but there are numerous chapters. Imam Tirmidhi's work contains 56 chapters. There are numerous chapters that I felt were not very relevant to today's context. And so I removed those chapters and I replaced them with other chapters. 
as we will see throughout the explanation of this work, inshallah, that I felt were more important for <coughs> contemporary times. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq in what we have done and to accept our works and to increase us in the ability to continue on this path of knowledge so that we can continue to acquire and sit with and take from our elders. Because as long as the ummah, the ummah takes from its elders, they are in khair. And when it starts to take from those who are junior, then we are in troubling times, as we find in the books of Hadith, the statement of some of the Sahaba. And as I said, this is a Muslim collection, and so every Hadith I narrate through a different scholar. So the collection comprises 41 Hadith. The reason I have 41 Hadith, as opposed to just having 40 Hadith, is because the Arba'een does not necessarily mean, if you write in the genre of the Arba'een, or the Arba'iniyat, you don't have to have just 40 hadith. It means 40 hadith for ma folk. Okay, that which is slightly above 40. So Imam al Nawi, rahimullah, we find, has in his collection uh, 42 hadith. Okay, and two of those hadith have an extra hadith. So we have 44 hadith if we look at it in that way. The reason I wrote or compiled 41 hadith is because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said Inna Allah witr yuhib al witr That indeed Allah is an odd number and he likes odd numbers And so I finished with 41 hadith in order to achieve and to practice upon this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ And as is tradition with the muhaddithin, I will start by Narrating Hadith al rahma al-Musalsal bil awwaliya by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, narrate this hadith, having heard it or read it to more than 300 scholars worldwide. And again, I'm not aware of anybody who has achieved that feat, as it's being the first hadith that I read or heard with these scholars. And I will suffice with the mentioning of the Sanad of a Sheikh. Zakaria al Kandahalawi, through whom I narrate through many of his students, uh, maybe more than 20 or 30 of his students that I have met from around the world, uh, such as uh, Sheikh Abdul Shukur al Barmawi from Burma, Sheikh Abdul Hafid al Makki from Makkah, uh, Sheikh uh, Wan Izzuddin from Malaysia, and many other shuh, and they narrate from Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria ibn Yahya al Kandahalawi al Chishti, Rahimullah who narrates from his Shaykh Khalil Ahmed al saharan Fori, Rahimullah, who narrates from his Shaykh Abdul Qayyum al-Badhanawi, who narrates from his Shaykh Muhammad Ishaq al-Dihlawi, who narrates from his Shaykh Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlawi, who narrates from his Shaykh Shah Waliullah Ahmed al-Dihlawi, who narrates from his Shaykh Shah al-Sheikh Abu Tahir al-Kawrani al-Kurdi, who narrates from his Shaykh Muhammad Ibrahim al-Kurdi al-Kawrani al-Muhajir al-Madani, and he narrates through numerous shuyukh, going back to Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and Amr ibn Dinar, and Abi Qabus, Mawla Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas, radiyallahu ta'ala, and qala, qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-Rahimun, yarhamuhum al-Rahman, irhamu man fil ardi, yarhamukum, aw yarhamukum man fil sama. Akhrajuhu al-Imam al-Tirmidhi, wa qala, hadha hadithun hasanun sahih. And this hadith is, al-Rahimun, yarhamuhum al-Rahman, those who are merciful, the most merciful, will show mercy to them. Rather, I prefer the use of the word compassion, because compassion, as we've mentioned to those of you who've studied with us before, encompasses, even though compassion in itself does not really give the full depth of the meaning, because the English language is a weak language, in comparison to the Arabic language that has far more depth. And so, compassion is closer to rahma than mercy, because mercy can also be shown by a volume. A tyrant can, it can be said that the tyrant showed mercy. But Rahma is something that is shown by those who have compassion in their hearts. And an, a tyrant does not have Rahma in his heart. And so, to fully and truly understand the word Rahma, we have to understand the origin or the etymology of this word. Rahma extends from the word Rahim, which means womb, the womb of the mother. And the womb of the mother and the living of the womb uh, or the living of the fetus and the child within the mother for nine months 
establishes such a bond that when you look at love around the world, if you look at the essence of love and if you look at the pinnacle of love, it is that love that a mother has for her child. That is the pinnacle of love in this world. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said in one hadith when he, you know, an authentic hadith that can be found in Sahih Muslim, where he pointed towards a lady, her baby was crying, and the baby was crying from hunger. So this late, this woman, Sahabiya, she was running frantically, looking, searching, and she grabbed the baby and immediately brought it to her breast and suckled the child. And so the Sahaba, they saw this uh, whole scenario. And the Prophet wasallam he said, did you see this? Do you see this woman? And they said, yes, we see this woman. And he said, do you see the compassion of this woman? And they said, yes, we see the compassion. So he said, do you think that this woman is capable of throwing her child into the fire? They said, no, how can she throw her child into the fire? I mean, look at this. So the Prophet wasallam said, Lallahu arhamu bi'ibadihi. Indeed, Allah is more compassionate and merciful to his ibad, to his slaves, then this woman is to her child, okay, by many, many more times. And so to understand the word Rahmah, remember we said it comes from the word Rahim. You know the, the love that the mother has for the child is such that she's willing to give up everything for her child. So we find that in a cold, on a cold night, perhaps the child urinates and wets the bed, as we all have done. <laughs> there is no one who, as you are a child, you don't know what is happening, you do not command uh, any control over your mental faculties. You are at uh, complete vulnerability. And so it's possible that the child urinates. What does the mother do? The mother does not take a stick or beat the child, but rather the mother, through her compassion, through her rahmah for the child, you know, looks at the child and changes the child and says, oh, you know, and, and feels sorry for the child. That maybe for one hour or two hours it was sleeping in this cold, wet, damp urine that it had urinated itself. And the mother feels that the problem is with her because she neglected her child in a way. But how was she to know? But you see that compassion, she doesn't put the blame on the child. She puts the blame on herself for failing to look after the child. That is because of her rahmah that she has. And similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is a rahman And from Him stems the word rahmah. And, for, and he is the essence of Rahmah. And everything that has Rahmah has a portion of Rahmah that comes from Ar Rahman. Ar Rahman for the Muslim and for the Kafir. And Rahim specifically for the Muslim. As we know when we read Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Okay. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if a person is to sin, Allah, what does he say in the Quran? Qul, ya ibadi. He says, say to my slaves, to my bonds people. Who are those bonds people? Those people who have wronged themselves, the sinners. So you look at, if you just, and this is why it's very important to study the Arabic language in order to be able to taste the words, in order to be able to really appreciate the words of the Quran. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of saying instead of saying you dirty sinner or you filthy uh, wrongdoer, no. He says, Qul, say O Muhammad, Ya ibadi, O slaves of Allah, Alladina Asrafu ala anfusim, those who wrong themselves. They're like, you know, you can just imagine like that child who's vulnerable, who made mistakes, who didn't know. Okay? What does Allah say to them? Ya ibad, alladhina asrafu ala anfusim. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not give hope in the rahmah of Allah, in the mercy of Allah, in the compassion of Allah. More compassion that the mother has for her child. Inna Allah yaghfir al-dhunub. Allah indeed forgives all of the sins. Jami'an. Okay. Inna Allah ghafur rahim. Indeed Allah is the most forgiving, the most compassionate. And so... That is the relationship between the creator and the creation, extending from this word Rahma. And we don't have much time to go into more explanation, but coming back to the hadith. So the second por por portion of the hadith, it says, man fil ardi, man fil sama. Have mercy on those on the earth, those in the heavens will have mercy upon you. So have mercy on those on the earth encompasses, it encompasses those who are Muslim and Kafir. In fact, 
the essence of this again comes from Surah Al-Anbiya where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you except as a compassion, as a source of compassion for all of creation. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, who's known as the Tarjuman al-Quran, who's known as the great Mufassir of Quran, he said that, that how that the compassion, we all know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is a compassion for, he, for Muslims. But how is he a source of compassion or mercy for the non-Muslim? Okay, so Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he answers this question and he says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that because of you and because of the position that you hold with me, I will not punish the people as I punished them in the previous nations. Meaning as a whole, as a, co- a complete nation, I will not punish them. Rather, their punishment will be differed until after Qiyamah. Okay, until the Day of Judgment. And so what, what we find is, for example, the people of Nuh alayhi salam, they perished completely as a peoples. Okay, the people of Salih, the, the people of Lut, the people of Thamud. And many, many of these Anbiya, when they prayed to Allah, their, the peoples perished entirely. But the Rahmah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is for the Kafir means that he has guaranteed for the Kafir an extension so he will not be punished as much as he does in terms of bad actions. He will, the kafir as a whole, as a, a complete nation, all of the kuffar, they will not be punished as a whole until after Qiyamah. So that, that, is, that is the rahmah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he has allowed Allah's compassion to extend to them till Qiyamah. Then they will be punished, you see. And so the hadith, it says, have mercy on those on the earth. Having mercy on those on the earth, this hadith, is a hadith which is generic. It does not say have mercy on the Muslims on the earth. It says have mercy on those on the earth. And that means that this compassion must extend to the Muslim and the non-Muslim. It extends to the Muslim and the Buddhist and the Hindu and the Christian. Whoever does not have any issue with you, who does not raise arms against you, have compassion to them. That is the defunct uh, or the default uh, feature of a Muslim. The default situation or uh, feature of Muslim is that you are compassionate. It is not the opposite. It is not that you are violent unless somebody is good to you, then you will be good to them. They scratch your back, you scratch their back. No, rather you are compassionate to everyone. Okay, and so this encompasses the non-Muslim and the Muslim. It goes on even beyond that. And it encompasses not only the human being, but also the animals, because they also walk on the earth. And it encompasses and goes on further. So it not only encompasses the human being and the animal, but it also encompasses the plant life and insects. And everything that crawls and walks on the face of this earth, you must have compassion towards. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ has said in a hadith that can be found in the Arba'un of Imam al-Nawi rahimullah, that Allah, katab Allah, يعني Allah has written an ihsan, ihsan on everything, excellence or being good or being uh, ex- uh, excellent uh, on everything. فَإِذَا قَتَلْتُمْ So if you kill, kill with ihsan. Meaning, kill in a swift way. Okay, there will be times where uh, one is required to kill, perhaps in self-defense. You have somebody entering your home uh, with a gun, with a knife, and you are saving yourself from the sharaf, the evil of that person. So here, you should kill that person if need be in a way that, re- that has ihsan. You don't, it doesn't mean you go and you shoot them in the foot, and then in the other foot, and then in the testicles, and then in the, you get a, gorge their eyes out and, and these things. No. Okay, if you have to, you do it in a way that has ihsan, that, is in, that has excellence, and it is in the best of ways to ease the pain. And then he also says, وَإِذَا ذَبَحْتُمْ And if you slaughter, فَحْسِنُ الذِّبْحَ So if you slaughter, also slaughter in the best of ways. So what we understand from this hadith is that the, when he said kill, this means for humans. Because otherwise he would not have said, if you slaughter, then slaughter in the best of ways. Because slaughtering is for the animal. Okay? So we understand from this is that compassion, even towards your enemy. If you have to kill someone in the battleground, okay, you do it in a way that, because of the necessity, you do it in a way that relieves that person of pain. You do not take uh, pleasure in giving people pain. 
There are certain groups and denominations and organizations out there that are bringing a bad name to Islam. They, they do things in the name of Islam and they are giving this impression that Muslims are barbarians. Okay? But if we look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we look at his sunnah, we can see, in fact, the ulama have said that the Prophet ﷺ never killed a single person in his life. He never killed a single person. It's not established in any hadith that he actually ever killed a person with his own hand in his life. Okay, again, why? Because he is the embodiment of Rahmah. Okay, rather people would come to him and they would say, O Prophet of Allah, I have committed adultery. And the woman, it comes in one narration, a woman came and she came to his right side and she said, O Prophet of Allah, I have committed adultery. So establish upon me the punishment of adultery, knowing that she knows that the punishment for adultery is stoning to death if you're married. Okay, so he turned his face from her, you know, to ignore her. Just so that maybe she changes her mind and goes back. Okay. Then she came from the left side and she said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I, have co- I am married, I have committed adultery. And then he turned his face away from her again. You know, just that maybe perhaps she'll go back and yani, make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then a third time she came. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Seize her and we have to apply the punishment that is prescribed upon her. Okay, but and then and he also said, Why do some of you come to me and tell me of your sins? Why not go and uh, and, and, and make toba to Allah and keep the affair between you and Allah? Why? Because when you come to me and tell me, I have to establish the punishment that is legislated in the Quran. But if you do something and you keep it between you and Allah, this is easier. Meaning, in, in essence, it's easier for him because his compassion وسلم, is such that he doesn't want to. He does not want to implement these punishments, but because he is there, he is prescribed as the legislator of these punishments. When somebody comes and insists, he has to. You know, he is binded by his uh, the, the requirements of his risala of his uh, of his nabuwa. Okay, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, he uh, coming back to what we we're saying. Even if you have to slaughter the animal, there are certain adab, there are certain etiquettes that one slaughters the animal. We find from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. People talk about animal rights that started maybe in 1970s and 80s, but in Islam we have animal rights from the time that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us about that. You know, we don't need other people to educate us about animal rights, and so. He said, even if you slaughter, there are numerous adab. You should not slaughter one sheep in front of another sheep. Because that is a form of slaughtering before slaughtering. When a person sees another sheep, uh, when one sheep sees the other one being decapitated or, or, or being cut up in front of it, then it, 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 it becomes uh, uh, afraid. And it becomes fearful. And it's like you're killing it before you actually kill it. You see? This ordeal that you're putting it through. Okay? And there are various other things. And so uh, we, we have to really remind ourselves that we are the people of compassion. And this tradition, it's a beautiful tradition. In fact, because this tradition is, as we said, Hadith al musalsal bil awwaliya. It is the hadith which has, it is known as the patterned chain narration of firstness. The patterned chain narration of firstness. What does that mean? It means that this was the first hadith that I heard from my shuyukh. And it was the first hadith that my shiuch heard from their shiuch. And it was the first hadith that my shiuch and my, my shiuch shiuch heard all the way over 1200 years back to Sufyan ibn Uyina. And it begs the question, why is it this hadith? You see? And books have been written to answer that question. We don't have time to go into it. But some people may say, well, it should have been إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, actions are governed by their intentions. Or it could have been the hadith of Jibreel, Mal Islam wal Iman wal Ihsan, or other hadith. Why is it this particular hadith? Because the Muslims, we are the people, we are the ambassadors of Rahmah. We are the ambassadors of peace. We find our greeting is peace. There is no other nation there that the prescribed greeting in their books is a peace. When you meet someone, we say, Peace be upon you. Okay? For the Muslim, our greeting is peace. Okay, our, te- our religion teaches us this. Okay, even Islam, the word Islam, it comes from two root words, a silm, okay, was salam. A silm means to submit, 
And through the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we achieved peace. This is what some of the ulama have said. So making silm, making sub, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the commandments of Allah and the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we achieve salam. Okay, so silm is one of the root words of Islam and salam is another root word from Islam. And so the ulama have said, when you submit to Allah, you yourself are the, be- the first person to benefit because you achieve <laughs> inner peace. How many people out there are searching for inner peace, are searching for uh, nirvana, I think they call it. (laughs) Everyone is searching for happiness, for inner peace. Okay, and it it can only be achieved through one way, and that is through Islam. It cannot be achieved. If a person wants to achieve prolonged and peace that goes over uh, eternally, uh, not something that lasts for three minutes, four minutes, and then once you uh, you come out of it, you are in a worse and a worse situation than you were before you went into it. You know, people, for example, they drink alcohol or they take drugs. What happens? You know, if they don't, once they wake up, they have a hangover. I mean, so they experience some some happiness, okay, for a few hours, but then when they came out of it, they were in a very bad situation. The same with drugs, and the same with anything. There, the only way to achieve peace eternally. Okay, and uh, is through the acceptance of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as shown to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Allah says in the Quran, Ala bi dhikri Allahi tatma'inna al qulub. Is it not, it is only through the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, that the hearts find contentment. You can try to find contentment and peace and happiness in other things, but you will not be able to attain that. You will only attain that through the dhikr and the remembrance and the following the injunctions of Islam as shown to us by the Prophet <coughs> And so have compassion on those on the earth, those in the heavens will have compassion upon you. And we are so much, uh, are we uh, are in need of, of rahmah, you know. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, no, no one will enter Jannah through their actions, but rather through the mercy on the compassion and the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one. We all strive, but no one can fulfill the complete right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you worshipped Allah every second of your life, you just kept saying, there are angels that Allah has created who have been living for hundreds and thousands of years. And every second, they are just making uh, tasbih, saying subhanallah, 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 wa alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Every second of every breath that they breathe, Okay, so even if you were to do that, you would still not be fulfilling the greatness and you will not, you'd still not be fulfilling the responsibility that you have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot say, what happens now, person says, I go for Jumu'ah, I go for Salat al-Eid, I give Zakat, and they think that I go for Hajj, okay, and they think that now they, Allah must give them Jannah. No, Allah is not incumbent upon Allah to give you Jannah. Through, because of what you have done through your actions. Rather, it is through only through the rahmah of Allah that you can enter Jannah. Now, so let us start with this collection, inshallah. The Arba'un Fik Shama'il Sayyid al Kawn. When we study the Shama'il, we have to understand that the Shama'il comes under the genre of Sirah. Sirah means, there are two meanings for Sirah. We have the, we have the linguistic meaning and we have the rhetorical meaning. Al Ma'na al Lughawi. And we have al-ma'na al-istilahi. Al-ma'na al-lughawi, sirah comes from the word sayr in Arabic. Sayr means the way, the path. Okay, so, fasiru fil ard. Allah says, move on the path, go through the path, go through the way on earth. And al-ma'na al-istilahi, the rhetorical meaning, the meaning with the scholars, is that it is, it is the biography or the biographical account of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when somebody says, "Have you studied the Sirah?" they mean the Sirah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, there are many works that have been authored in the Sirah. Uh, for example, the Sirah of Ibn Hisham is one of the more popular works. We have, 
for example, other scholars that have works that have covered the seerah, such as Imam Ibn Kathir, who has authored Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, and he starts from before the creation of mankind and to, to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and beyond that. And so the Shama'il falls under the subject of the seerah. And the study of the Shama'il is one of the greatest aspects of this deen. There are many benefits that one can obtain from the study of the Shama'il. One of the benefits that you can obtain is, and the most important benefit that you can obtain, and the goal that all of us should be seeking from the studying of the Shama'il, is an increasement in the love that we have for the Prophet ﷺ. For none of you truly believes, as the Prophet ﷺ has said, لا يؤمن أحدكم None of you truly believes حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين In a hadith which is متفق عليه متفق عليه means agreed upon It means it is it, when we say a hadith is agreed upon we mean it has come in Bukhari and Muslim It means that you cannot reject it Its authenticity is unquestionable and so in this hadith the Prophet ﷺ said none of you believes until I am more beloved to him than his father his children and everyone of his relatives and every person so none of you truly believes just ponder that none of you truly believes until you love the Prophet ﷺ more than you love your most favorite child, more than you love your wife, more than you love anyone else. Bal hatta to the extent that we find in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Hisham in Sahih Muslim, where he says, We were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ when he entered upon us, and Umar radiallahu anhu came, and he said to the Prophet, ﷺ, O Prophet of Allah, Inni uhibbuka, I love you more than anyone illa nafsi, except myself. So he loves the Prophet ﷺ. He's reached this conclusion. He sat down, he contemplated, and he reached the conclusion that he loves his wife, he loves his children, he loves his father and mother, but the person he loves more than all of these people is the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. But the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يا عمر, no, يا عمر, no. You, meaning, you have not achieved faith, O Umar. You have not achieved true faith. He said, how? Until when? He said, حتى أكون in, until I am more beloved to, to you than even your own self. You see, Imam al-Asbahani he says that the love of oneself is something which is jibilli, which is intrinsic which a person is forced upon. You love yourself. This is something that is instinctive than more than you love anyone else. So Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he was talking from an in that position. So he, he came to the conclusion that he loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anyone else but himself. Then the Prophet said, no, you have not achieved faith. So he went away and he sat for a few moments a few minutes and after a few minutes he came back to the Prophet ﷺ and he said actually I love you more than my own self so the, the ulama they said that this was Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu he, he if he looked at himself perhaps he said he saw himself Umar that person who it would said about him that perhaps the himar perhaps the donkey of Umar becomes Muslim but Umar cannot be Muslim. You know, this person, Umar, my own self, I was hell-bent on going to Jahannam. My actions, how I was conducting myself. But then there was a man who came and he grabbed my hand and he saved me from going to Jahannam. Muhammad, and he was Muhammad. So who is more deserving of my love? Myself, who I was going to Jahannam, or this man who saved me from the fire Okay, and took me towards the direction of Jannah. So he contemplated that, some of the ulama have said. And then he came to the conclusion that Muhammad is more deserving of my love than even my own self. 
And so that is what we have to achieve. We have to love the Prophet wasallam more than we even love our own selves. Then we love our wealth, our wives, our children, everything. And un until you reach that stage, you have not reached the stage of true faith. And this is why we find in the hadith, which is also muttafaqun Ali, that the Prophet wasallam said that a person only tastes the true taste of Iman, the sweetness of Iman, is when the Prophet and Allah are more beloved to him than anything else. Okay? This is the first condition of this hadith. That you only taste the true sweetness of faith when Allah and his Rasul are more beloved to you than anything else. And the second one is that he, when he meets his Muslim brother, he meets him and loves him only for the sake of Allah. Again, this is very rare nowadays to meet a Muslim brother and to love him only for the sake of Allah. Not because you want to take any benefit from him, but you just love him and you have this love for him just because he's a Muslim and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet wasallam said seven types of people will be under the shade on the day that there will be no shade except that shade. And he mentioned one of them and he said, the one, who, the, those two who, يعني, they meet each other, and they separate from each other, own on the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's very difficult nowadays to find genuine friends, brothers, who, that, who you love only for the sake of Allah. And the third thing, in order to have sweetness in faith, he said, أَنْ يَعُودُ إِلَى الْكُفْرِ يعني, And to go back into, أَنْ يكره, To hate, to go back into kufr. You know, that a person hates to go back into kufr more than he hates to be thrown in the fire. Shay Azim. You know, that you hate to go back into kufr. Anything that is related to kufr more than you hate to be thrown in the fire. There's no, there's, is there anyone who, hate, who likes to be thrown in the fire? All of us hate to be thrown in the fire. It's one of the most horrendous ways of dying is being burnt alive. This is why many people, when but some towers were being burnt they jumped from the tower okay instead of burning alive because they know the pain of being burnt is worse than the pain of jumping it's instantaneous you jump and you you die when burning alive is you the whole your whole body every vein every sensory gland experiences pain so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and the third condition is that a person hates to go back to kufr more than he hates to be thrown in the fire then you have tasted the true, then you can start to think about tasting the sweetness of Iman. Questions at the end, inshallah. And so, we look at the examples of the Sahaba, how much they loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So we find that the person who loved him the most was Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. This Sahabi al-Jaleel, if we wanted to talk just about his love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we would need a series of lectures. <coughs> this Sahabi who was being beaten and left to, to die. The people, they left him as he was dead. And he stayed in this state, it said according to some reports, a few days. And he stayed in this state of unconsciousness. They left him for dead. And then when he woke up, who was there behind him or next to him? The one that loves him the most in this world, his mother. His mother, even though he was a grown man. His age and the age of the Prophet ﷺ, it was about three years, two and a half, three years difference. Okay, so he was in his maybe around 40, 39, 40 years old. Okay, and his mother's there, and she says, "Oh, son, drink. You know, get. You need strength. You need to have some food and drink." And he said, "No, I will not drink." How is Muhammad? The first time he opens his eyes, he said, "How is my friend Muhammad?" You know, and they, his mother said, don't worry about him, you, just, you, you have to worry about yourself, you know. Look at your condition, you've been left for dead. Uh, take some drink and water. He said, no, by Allah, I will not taste a single drop until my eyes see Muhammad is in safety. Just imagine that love that he had, subhanAllah. And then we find that Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu, the Mu'addin, the one who was freed by Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was purchased and then set free. And Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu is dying in Damascus and he's on his deathbed. And his wife and his family, as happens, are crying next to him. 
and saying that you are in your last moments, you are going to die. And they're crying and he's laughing and smiling. And they said, what's wrong with you? How can you be smiling and laughing in this time, the time when you're leaving this world? And he said, because it is only a few moments and then I will be joined back to, with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he's smiling and laughing, uh, not because, and this is, this is the love. He's happy to leave his mother, his wife and his children and he, because he realizes that in only a few moments, he will be back with his Habib al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will be back with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we find in a, a narration that can be found in the seerah of Ibn Hisham, a woman in the battle of Uhud. Four male members of her family, her son, her brother, her father, and her husband, all go in this battle, or in the battle of Uhud. And she stands on the outskirts waiting for the warriors after the battle to come back to the town. And as she stands there, the first group of people, she asks them when they come back, How is Muhammad? How is Muhammad? How is my beloved? And they say, We commiserate you, sister, on the death of your brother. She says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. How is Muhammad? You know, she's just been given the news that her brother has been killed. Okay? And she's, she says, Inna lillahi. From, we are from Allah and to Allah we will return. How is Muhammad? And then after a while, a group come and they say, we commiserate you on the death of your husband. And she says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. But how is Muhammad? You know, she's been given the news that her husband has died. And then the third time, she's given the news that your father has been killed. And she says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. How is Muhammad? You know, her father has died. And then she's given the news that Kabid, her own soul, her own body has died, her son. They come and they say, your son has been killed. And she says, Inna lillahi wa inna How is Muhammad? That was her concern. That was her love. That is a true demonstration of the love that a person should have for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Four members, four irreplaceable members of her family have died. And she is only concerned about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then later on, the news reaches her and she sees the Prophet ﷺ from far and she rejoices in happiness and she says, Kullu musibatin ba'daka jalal. Every musibah, every problem after you is bearable. Meaning I can lose everyone but I cannot lose you, Muhammad ﷺ. That is just, that love, that is true love. You know, to be able to lose those members, even her own son, her father, people who are irreplaceable. But because she still has Muhammad, She's rejoicing and she's happy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A, a, a young woman, she comes to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she gives him the, as we find in the story, in the, in the seerah, she gives him her baby. And she says, I have nothing to give. I have no male members in my family who are participating in defending, uh, يعني, and, uh, in, the, in the jihad. And, but I have this baby. Take this baby with you. And he, what can I do with this baby? You know, what is this baby going to benefit me? And, it's, and she said that it is possible that somebody fires an arrow towards you. Hold up this baby so that the arrow pierces the baby, but does not pierce you and does not touch you. you know, that is the love that they had for the Prophet ﷺ. You know, for him, his that, for his command, for everything. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is sitting outside the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ when the Prophet is giving the khutbah and he says to them, sit down. You know, the people in the masjid, in, in order to reduce the commotion and the noise, he tells them, sit down. And he's outside, and it's, it's Jum'ah, and it's very hot, and he says, sit down. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha is outside in the heat of midday of Medina, 40 degrees, and he sits down there. And some of the people, they said, the Prophet is not addressing you, he's addressing the people in the mosque. He said, I heard him say, sit down, so I sat down. I, he didn't say, sit down, those who are in the mosque. Or sit down, those are outside. He said, sit down. So I sat down. So after he fin the Prophet ﷺ finished, he came and he saw Abdullah ibn Rawaha sitting in that place. And then he said to him, Zadakallahu ta'atan ila ta'a. Yani, may Allah increase you in your obedience, in your, may Allah increase you further in your obedience to him. Because the obedience to the Prophet ﷺ is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the Sahaba, these are our examples. They're, those were the true examples of the love 
Why? Because they had that suhba, they had that companionship with the Prophet ﷺ. Just to see him is to love him. You see, just looking at him, people would come become Muslim by just looking at him. And they would say, when I saw him, I realized that this is not the face of a liar. This, this face, this Mubarak, blessed face of the Prophet ﷺ is not one of a liar. And so there are many examples that we can talk about the love of the Prophet ﷺ. And in starting the Shama'il, inshallah, in this book, the Arba'un, as I always mention, my condition is that I do not want to have anyone here who is miserly or tight-fisted, in other words. And when I say that, I don't mean that I want you to give me generous gifts. No, <laughs> but I mean by that is I'm referring to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that is narrated by Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu in the Jami of Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi rahimullah where he says, Al-Bakheel al-ladhi man dhukirtu indahu falam yusalli alayhi The Bakheel, the miserly one, is the one who my name is mentioned in front of him and he does not send salutations upon me. So as we are studying at work on his blessed sublime qualities one of the best things that we can get into the practice of doing is sending salutations upon him sallallahu alaihi wasallam every time we hear his name we try to get into this practice so it becomes a habit every time you hear his name sallallahu alaihi wasallam don't suffice with some statements people say saying sallallahu alaihi wasallam once is enough why should we suffice with that which is lower why should we not aspire for that which is higher when it comes to the affairs of the deen, or when it comes to the affairs of the dunya, we always want to have the highest grade and the best grade and the, 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 the 4.0 GPA and we want our children to achieve the best grades. When it comes to the deen, we say, oh, it's only a sunnah, it's only this, it's only mustahab. No, we should also, and that should be the asal. The asal should be, the origin should be that we strive in akhirah. As the Sahaba strove, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to strive in Akhirah. And for the dunya, we should allow ourselves to go through it and not to worry about our neighbors and about striving and about competing with other people. That should be the asr. But what has happened now? We strive and compete with each other in the dunya and we make excuses and neglect the Akhirah. You see, if you look at the Sahaba, you see Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, you look at Sayyidina Umar, always competing, striving with each other to be the best. So we find, uh, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, we need wealth, we need wealth to prepare the army, the expedition. So on that day, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was poor. He had spent everything that he had. So he went home. And what did he do? Okay, for Sayyidina Umar went home, and he gathered his wealth and he said, today I'm going to outstrip Abu Bakr because I'm more wealthy than Abu Bakr. So I'm going to bring more today. So he went home and he gathered up his wealth into one, in one place. And he took half and he said, this is for my family and this is for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, half is a huge amount. Okay, This is half of my personal wealth. Half I will give to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and half I will keep for my family. Okay, So he went and he gave it. So... The Prophet said, what did you leave? Mother tarakti, and what did you leave ahlik for your family? He said, half. And I brought half. And then he said, okay. And after some moments, Sayyidina Abu Bakr came. And he said, what did you leave for your family? And what did you bring? He said, I brought everything for, for you. Okay, and he had a smaller bag. Okay, he said, this is everything I have in my house. I brought it for you. What did you leave for your family? He said, Allah wa Rasulullah. I left Allah and His Prophet for my family. So they were constantly striving for Akhirah. One time, the Prophet ﷺ said, if anybody wants to learn the Qur'an, so they should learn it from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Okay, one of the great reciters of the Qur'an. And so, uh, what happened is, as soon as the majlis finished, Umar, he went there. Okay, because he, that, that's how they were. You know, if he says this, so immediately he went to, to study the Qur'an with Abdullah ibn Umar, okay, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And when he reached there, who did he see? He saw Abu Bakr to beat him. So he, even, even though he was younger, okay, and faster, by the time he reached there, he saw Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was already there studying the Qur'an. One time, uh, there is an old lady in the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, in his Khilafah, he's the Khalifa. In essence, he is the Sultan of the Muslims, the King of the Muslims, yani the leader of the Muslims. And there is an old woman, 
and she used to be looked after. And one day, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu, he used to go to her house and he would clean up. She was a blind lady and an elderly lady living on the outskirts of Al Madina. She didn't have anyone to look after her. So he would go there and clean, sweep her house, pick up the rubbish, put it in a corner, clean up her house and cook some breakfast. And he would put it for her in a dish, put it in front of her, and then he would leave and go on his work. So one day, Sayyidina Umar who came to this came across the same woman. And he one day, or perhaps on that day, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was busy in other affairs. He prepared something for her and he left. Then the next day he came, he found that this woman, somebody else, had already prepared for her. Okay, her food and cleaned her house, everything. And he got shocked. Who is this? Who is coming before me? Because he he knew that yani, that his competition was with Abu Bakr, but now he was afraid that somebody else was exceeding him in Akhirah, in, in striving for Akhirah. So he hid, he hid, and he waited after Fajr, after the time of Fajr had passed, and the Jama'ah had finished, and he hid and he looked, and he saw a man go in, and the man had covered his face, and then after about half an hour, 45 minutes, he saw a man came out, and he just, he glimpsed and he recognized, and he saw that it was Abu Bakr. And he said, Alhamdulillah, that nobody has exceeded me except Abu Bakr. As for him, I have given up any hope of ever exceeding him. You know, I was afraid that it was somebody else. Okay, but it's, it's Abu Bakr, Alhamdulillah. You know, so subhanAllah, you see the Sahaba always constantly competing when it comes to the matters of Akhirah. You know, but our priorities have changed. The, the Sahaba and the Salaf al-Salih and our Akabir of this Ummah, they used to have the deen in their hearts and the dunya in their hands. So when the need for the deen came, they would throw the dunya because it was in their hands and it was easy to get rid of. Like the staff of Musa السلام, when he said, al qiha threw the, so he threw, okay. So the same way, they would throw the dunya and they would go in the effort of the deen. But we have changed and so what we have now is that we have deen in our hands and the dunya in our hearts. So when something comes for the dunya, we throw the, the deen. Oh, it's okay, we can combine five prayers at one time, okay, because I have to work. Oh, it's okay, I can change my name. Okay, my name is Muhammad, now it's Mo. It's Bilal, now it's Billy, okay, because people will make fun of me, okay, people with this. So anything for the deen, I can throw, it's not a problem, because I need to focus on my dunya. You know, that is the goal. See how things have changed, priorities have changed. So we come inshallah now to the study of the Shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first hadith. Babu ma ja'a fi khalqi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter that has come in regards to the creation, the sublime creation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Would anybody like to read the hadith? In Arabic? The microphone is okay. Or should I read? Just. Abdullah bin Yusuf, Malik ibn Anas, an ibn Abi Rahman. عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه أنه سمع يقول كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس بالطويل البائن ولا بالقصير ولا بالأبيض الأمهق وليس بالآدم وليس بالآدم وليس بالجعد القطط ولا بالسبت بعثه الله على رأس أربعين سنة فأقام بمكة عشر سنين وبالمدينة عشر سنين توفاه الله وليس في رأسه وليس في رأسه ولحيته عشرون شعرة بيضاء Rabi ibn Abi Abdurrahman narrated I heard Anas ibn Malik may Allah be pleased with him describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was neither very tall nor short neither absolutely white nor dark brown. His hair was neither curly nor straight. Allah raised him when he was 40 years old, meaning revelation began. 
Afterwards, he resided in Mecca for 10 years and in Medina for, for years. When he returned to Allah, there were scarcely 20 white hairs in his ha head and beard. So this chapter, Babu Maja fi Khalqi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chapter that has come in regards to the sublime outer appearance and creation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is in fact the first chapter also that comes in the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah. And the ulama, they say that some of them have said that Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah should have started with the inner qualities because the inner qualities are more important than the outer aspects of a person. And some of them have said, but the first thing that you see when you see a person that causes you generally to love or to dislike that person is, whether we like it or not, the outer aspects of a person. So when you see somebody and you see that they look, uh, they, they look in a way that is scary or they look, uh, they, they, they're frowning, their person, their description is not handsome, for example, or beautiful, then that may affect your interpretation of that person. So that's the first thing that you see of a person. Okay, and this is why Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah wanted to start with this chapter. And the reason behind that is because the first thing that you see of a person is the outer aspects. <clears throat> of course, what is important for a human being is what is the inner aspects. And this is why we find in the hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, would recommend that we pray for our inner aspects and we, we, we should say Allahumma kama hassanta khalqi fahassin khuluqi Oh Allah, as you have beautified my outer appearance beautify my inner appearance or aspect and Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah starts with this chapter as we mentioned because this is the first thing that a person sees of an, another person and as we said the Prophet وسلم, so many people they would just look at him and they would recognize that he was not a person who was a liar many of them said that this is not the face of a liar this is not the countenance or the beauty or the handsomeness of a liar and they would see so just looking at him for many people was enough to accept him as the Prophet they would, and recognize him. And we mentioned this earlier, and this is why Allah says in the Quran, وَيَعْرِفُونَكَ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءُهُمْ That they recognize you as they recognize their children, their sons. So they recognize the Prophet as they recognize the, their own sons from his beauty, his outer aspects, his sublime outer aspects. And this is why one of the beautiful couplets we find of the poet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Hassan ibn Thabit, who is known as the poet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, وَأَحْسَنَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَى قَدْتُ عَيْنِي وَأَجْمَلَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدَ النِّسَاءُ خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّعًا مِنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ كَأَنَّكَ قَدْ خُلِقْتَ كَمَا تَشَاءُ وَأَحْسَنَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَى قَدْتُ عَيْنِي More handsome than you. I have never ever seen, my eye has never fallen upon. More beautiful than you, women have never given birth to. You have been created free from any blemish. As if you have been created as you wish to be created. You know, that was the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was given the pinnacle of beauty in the outer aspects. He was in fact more handsome than Yusuf alayhi salam. However, as Imam al-Qurtubi rahimullah said, that his true beauty was not shown to us. Rather, there was a hijab placed upon his true beauty. For had his true beauty been shown to us, none of us would be able, or none of the Sahaba would even be able to look at him. So a hijab was placed. And this is why Yusuf alayhi salam, in the physical sense of beauty, was given as the Prophet ﷺ said, Shatr al-Jamal. He was given 
or husn, half of beauty. Okay, and the, the other half was distributed amongst humankind until the day of Qiyamah. And Aisha radiallahu anha, as we find in the books of Seer, she would say that the Ashab, the people or the friends of Zulaikha, they cut their fingers, okay, when they saw the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam, as we know from the Quran. But the companions of the Prophet, when they see him, they are willing to cut their necks for him. You know, of course, the wife is always praising her own husband, and so she's, she, she says this in praise of her husband. Uh, and so, when we talk about the Prophet وسلم, we say as the Sha'ir has said, when we praise him, when we talk about his beauty, however much we speak about it, we cannot really give the full essence of his beauty. And this is why the Sha'ir, he says, مَا إِنْ مَدَحْتُ مُحَمَّدًا بِمَقَالَتِي وَلَكِنِّي مَدَحْتُ مَقَالَتِي بِمُحَمَّدِي Okay, that I have not, مَا إِنْ مَدَحْتُ مُحَمَّدًا I have not praised Muhammad by my speech or by my article. Rather, I have raised the level of my speech by the very mention of the word Muhammad, by the very mention of his name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the hadith here, if we look at it, we find, in fact, that this is the narration I brought. I brought the narration in this collection. I tried my best to bring a hadith as much as possible from Bukhari, because that is the most authentic book in this religion, in this deen, after the Quran, after the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, as the ulama have unanimously agreed. And so, this narration actually is also the first narration in the compilation of Imam Tirmidhi, rahimullah. But it comes through his isnad. Here, I have brought it through the isnad of Imam Bukhari, rahimullah. His isnad he narrates from Qutayba ibn Sa'id, uh, from Qutayba, and Qutayba was from one of his uh, ajalli and one, one of his greatest shuyukh. Okay, uh, and uh, many uh, the the Imma Sitta they narrate through Qutayba ibn Sa'id. Again, we don't have time to go into the rijal, into the isnad, and to discuss each of the people that occurs in the isnad, uh, but uh, we'll just touch on it. Uh, Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah brings this uh, his isnad from Qutayba, Qutayba from Rabi ibn Abdul Rahman, uh, or Qutayba from Malik ibn Anas, the great Imam of Dar al Hijra, Imam Malik ibn Anas al Asbahi rahimullah. And Imam Malik narrates from Rabi ibn Abdul Rahman, and Rabi ibn Abdul Rahman, who was known as Rabi al Ray, narrates from Anas ibn Malik, the Khadim, the servant of the Prophet, who served him for more than 10 years. And he said that I served the Prophet ﷺ for more than 10 years. And he never rebuked me or scolded me, scolded me or hit me or told me off. Or even said to me, why did you do this in this way and not do it in this way? And you have to understand that Anas ibn Malik, when he came into the service of the Prophet ﷺ, was about 10 years old. And when he passed away, he was about 20 years old. So for Anas, for this young child, Okay, to never be rebuked or told off or, said or complained about, it just shows you how much compassion the Prophet ﷺ has. Now you, t you speak to men and they make mistakes and you get irritated by their mistakes. Just imagine yani you have a child who's serving you. That person definitely is going to make numerous mistakes. And in that time, the Prophet never scolded him or rebuked him or told him off. In fact, in some narrations we find in the lesser known compilations of hadith, he would tell his sahaba not to talk about Anas and not to, to, to tell Anas off. Anhu. And the reason Imam, Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah, he starts his collection with this hadith is perhaps because this is the highest isnad that he has in his compilation. And that is the Ruba'iyat. He has four people between him and between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he has Qutayba, and Qutayba narrates from Malik ibn Anas. Malik ibn Anas narrates from Rabi ibn Abd Rahman, and he narrates from Anas ibn Malik. And that al rubai that means four people, that is the highest that Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah has in his Shama'il. So it was apt for him to start with this hadith, as is the tradition amongst the muhaddithin, to start usually with the higher isnad, and then to mention the lower isnad. And moving on to looking at this hadith, we see that it says that Anas ibn Malik said that the Prophet ﷺ was neither very tall nor was he very short. <coughs> we understand that the stature 
The stature of the Prophet ﷺ was of a medium stature, aqrab ila tool, but it was nearer to being tall. Okay, so it was of a medium stature, nearer to being tall than to being short. They said one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ was that when he would be standing alone, people would be seen in their real height. So Sayyidina Abbas, who was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he was very tall. And people would see if Abbas was at a distance and the Prophet ﷺ was at a distance, they, they would see the, dis- the, the difference in height. But when the Prophet ﷺ would be surrounded by his companions, it was as if he was taller than anyone else. And this was a miracle. And the ulama have said that this is because Allah did not like for anyone to be above his Prophet, above the Prophet ﷺ. So it was as if he was raised, as if he was floating in the air or raised, so that he appeared to be taller than any of his companions. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet ﷺ was not extremely white or pale, nor was he dark. Rather, we know about his physical complexion that he was abiyad mushrab, and he was white uh, mixed with a reddish tinge. Okay, he was white mixed with a reddish tinge or a wheat or wheatish of color. He was neither extremely pale white like Norwegians or Scandinavians, nor was he dark like Indians or even darker than that. In fact, some of the ulama have said that it is kufr to say that the Prophet ﷺ was black. Okay, because that is tantamount to uh, you know, cursing him or to saying something bad about the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, you know, for example, in Christianity, they say all sorts of things. So you find, for example, some Christians, they have statues of Jesus as a black man. Okay, in some denominations, uh, they, they just change around with their religion. For example, I, I came across one person one time and he said, uh, even in Islam you believe about Adam and Eve? I said, yes. And they said, well, in our religion, uh, we, uh, I, we don't believe about in Adam and Eve. We believe it was Adam and Steve, you know. <laughs> and then he told me that he belonged to the homosexual Christians. <laughs> so, so, you know, whereas in Islam... If you, make, if you say something like that, you're removed from the fold of Islam. You cannot say these silly things and believe these silly things. <laughs> no. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was neither very white nor very brown. <coughs> and his hair was neither very straight nor very curly. Yeah, rather, his hair was wavy. Wavy means that his hair was uh, straight but with a curl at the end. So his hair was wavy. If one of the things that you see when you study his shamal, even his physical appearance, is that of tawassut, yani that of a medium uh, range, uh, not to one extreme nor the other. He was neither very dark nor was he very white. He was neither very tall nor was he very short, nor was he short or very short. He was, his hair was neither very uh, uh, straight nor was it very curly. And, and, and this way, many, many things about the Prophet ﷺ. And then we find that it said, Allah sent him or commissioned him at the age of 40. And this is uh, established that the Prophet ﷺ was commissioned at the age of 40. And the reason behind this, as some of the ulama have said, is perhaps because the age of 40, as Allah mentions is in the Qur'an, إِذَا بَلَغَ أَحَدْهُمْ يعني When a person reaches the age of 40, Huh? No. So, uh, uh, so when a person reaches uh, the age of 40, their mental faculties become complete. So mentally a person is complete at the age of 40. Before the age of 40, you are still developing, your brain is still developing. Okay. When you reach the age of 40, your brain has developed, you have gone through the experiences that you require to go through in order for your brain to become complete. Whereas physically, it varies. Physically, a person is at their peak at the age of 33. And this is why the age of, uh, of Muslims in Jannah is 33, as this can be found in the hadith of Muslim Imam Ahmad, that that will be the age. Because physically, you are at your peak when you are 33. After 33, you start going downhill physically. Okay, and this is even, uh, you, you look at, subhanAllah, the hadith says 33. 
But even if you look at football players or professional sports players, or you find that when the football player is before the age of 30, 31, 32, high price. Once they reach 33, very few of them continue after 33. Because physically their body can no longer take it. After 33, whether you like it or not, your body physically starts going downhill. Whereas mentally, 40. Once you reach 40, that is the pinnacle. A few, after a few years, you're, even mentally you start going into weakness after the age of uh, 40. And so the age of 40 is the best time for somebody as a prophet to be sent. Because they have now enough in terms of life experience, in terms of the mental faculties, for them to be given this huge risala. Okay, we were talking about yesterday. And that is the Qur'an to be revealed in their heart. At the age of 40, that is the right time to receive such a burden upon them. And then he resided in Mecca for 10 years and in Medina for 10 years. We know that the Prophet ﷺ resided in Mecca for 13 years, as is the position of the Jamhur. So how do we explain this hadith? Some of the ulama have said that Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik who mentions this لِسَّبِيلِ التَّقْرِيبِ for the purposes of rounding off. So he's rounding off. So 10, instead of saying 13 and 10, okay, he's saying 10 and 10. And that's why when he mentions the age he passed away, he says, and he passed away at 60. When we know that he, the Prophet wasallam, left this world at the age of 63. Okay, and that is the position of the Jamhur of the ulama. But because he's rounding off, he says 10 and 10 and 60. Okay, and some of the ulama have said 10 years in Mecca, because after he was commissioned, he didn't actually make open da'wah, an open call for the first three years. And that's how they explain this 10 years. <coughs> now, and then it says here, then he returned to Allah, and when he passed away, there were hardly 20 white hairs in his beard and his hair, head. 20 white hairs in his beard and his head. And again, that is from the mu'jizat of the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, there is a chapter that will come talking about his white hairs. And we find that the most sound opinions are between 9, and 13, 9 13, 14 white hair. But again, because of the rounding up, so it's 20 is the maximum. And we, we talk about that, inshallah. Let us move on to the next.